How many of you were here last week for Chrissy's sermon, Selfless Life? How good was that? So good. Well, today I want to take you to a well-known text in Luke chapter 9. Um, It's the account of the feeding of the 5,000, and it's recorded four times in the different Gospels, across the four Gospels. So we're going to read it from verse 10. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. By the way, I'm not so sure that having dinner with me is all that a good reward. Please don't let that put you off signing up to volunteer, okay? Because it's, I don't know why I say yes to all of these crazy ideas from my team. But, you know, we go along with it anyway. Then he took them and went aside privately into, please don't ask me silly questions too, if that's, when we do have dinner. Please don't ask me crazy theological questions, okay? Because I would like, I'm an introvert, so just let, let, let conversation flow freely. Is that okay? All right? But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him and he... Please, no vegans as well. If it's a... You mess with my head when you say things like that before I preach. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, send the multitude away. So the disciples saying, send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place here. Verse 13, but he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, well, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people, for there were about 5,000 men. Then he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them, And gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled. And 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. Can we give Jesus a big shout of praise for the incredible text? I want to speak to you today on the thought, miracle hands. Show me your hands. If you've got hands, show me your hands. Turn to your neighbor and say, you've got miracle hands. Turn to your other neighbor and say, you don't know it yet, but you've got miracle hands. Miracle hands. I want to talk to you today about miracle hands. I want to give you a quick synopsis of this account here in uh, Luke chapter 9. We see this account nuanced differently um, through the other gospels as well. But it's the end of the day. So the people had been following Jesus and you know, lots and lots of people, a massive crowd, thousands of them. They are so hungry to hear more of what Jesus had to teach, this life-giving, grace-filled message of the gospel of the kingdom. They're hearing it for the first time, these Jews. And, you know, they, they, they just... They, they, they follow Jesus until it's too late to go and get food in the towns and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. And so Jesus notices, had compassion on them. The disciples thought that Jesus were actually taking them to a quiet place to knock off for the day. How many of you look forward to knocking off at the end of the day? Like that's a favorite time of the day for you. Come on, how many of you? All four of you, come on. Like, you really look forward to it. It's like 5 p.m., 6 p.m., and you look forward to going home, and you start to think ahead about all the chill-out things you're going to be doing for the rest of the night, like getting into your home clothes. How many of you look forward to getting into your home clothes? Oh, hallelujah, right? Sitting down on the couch with your dinner and whatever and watching TV and knocking off. Well, the disciples were in that same headspace. It's the end of the day, and they just... You know, they just wanted to knock off. Jesus has compassion on the crowd. He sees them and he sees that they are hungry. It's the end of the day. The disciples said to Jesus, you know, um, you know, we've had a bit of a conversation amongst ourselves. And we've also taken a bit of a survey of the crowd. And we think, Jesus, that it would be a really good idea for you to send them away back into the towns and villages to get their own food. Because we ain't got nothing to feed them with here. Right? How many of you know some, someone in your life that always likes to speak up on behalf of other people? Well, this was the disciples. We always have one in the church. You know, um, um, Pastor Ken, um, um, you know, I've had a chat with some people and we all agree the music's too loud. Or, or you know, we, all, we all agree that the coffee is not very nice here at church. There's always someone right, speaking on behalf of a friend. The disciples were doing it that day. Luke chapter 9. Send everybody home. right? And then Jesus probably should have listened to the disciples because it made sense. There was no KFC. There was no fast food outlets. There was no food court there. Where are these people going to get fed? It's the end of the day. They're running out of daylight. And yet Jesus says something so radical. He says this to them in verse 13. You give them something to eat. 
How many of you know that Jesus was readying the disciples for a miracle? You give them something to eat. This is a vital part of our discipleship to understand that we need to take responsibility for not just bringing people to Jesus, but we need to take responsibility for sustaining the encounter that people have with Jesus. It's the responsibility of the church. It's the responsibility of the disciples. Jesus said, you feed them, you give them something to eat, fully knowing that it's the end of the day, daylight's running out, there's nowhere that there's anyone can buy any food, and the disciples had no money. And the last thing the disciples wanted to hear from Jesus' mouth was these words, you feed them. Have you ever felt like God has asked you to do something where you've had no means, no capacity, no energy, no, you know, no more margin to do the thing that God has actually asked you to do? How many of you have ever been in that place? Yeah. Well, right here, the disciples were actually facing exactly the same thing. Can I suggest to you that Jesus was actually using this moment as a teaching moment and a prime opportunity to teach the disciples something very, very unique and very, very special as part of their discipleship? How many of you would agree with me that what we have going here, the church, his ecclesia, is actually a spiritual and supernatural gathering? Four of you. The rest think that this is some community group. Come on now. How many of you would agree that the church of Jesus Christ, this is where we gather every weekend right across Australia, believers, people that walk with Jesus. When we do this, it's a spiritual and supernatural occurrence. The church is God's idea. It was birthed out of the baptism of the, of the Holy Spirit. God birthed the church into being His ecclesia, the body of Christ. It's a spiritual thing. And yet so many of us can have a very natural way of looking at our contribution towards a spiritual thing called the church. We can have a very carnal view of how we ought to play our part in this thing called the body of Christ. And so when it comes to things like serving, when we hear uh, that on, on the screen, we can have a very carnal or temporal or earthly way of looking at our lives. And so we feel, we hear this, go, okay, you know, we, we, we hear Tam talk about teams, etc. This is how we consider serving. We then look at what we can manage in our lives. So we look at our own schedules. We go, oh man, I've got 29 dance re recitals that our daughters need to be driven to every week. And we've got this project on at work and the landscaping project we've got going on at home that's not going very well. And I've got this ill elderly father we need to visit twice a week. And then we consider about how much margin we got, how much energy we have. And then we add up all of the things that are supposedly busy and important lives have got going on. And then we look at what is remaining and then we decide whether we can manage to serve Jesus with it. So we've got a very earthly way, an earthly framework of thinking about our contribution to the supernatural part of God called the church. And in fact, this was exactly the response of the 12 disciples. They considered all that they had in the natural. They considered that they were running out of daylight. They considered the circumstance. They were reading the room. People were hangry. How many of you have, uh, live with someone that isn't quite themselves when they're hungry? They get hangry. Well, multiply that by thousands of people. So the disciples are going, they were freaking out. They're going, oh, man, we don't have time, energy, resource to do any of this, Jesus. And yet Jesus says to them, you feed them. What was Jesus teaching them? Jesus was teaching them that if all that we do is just serve him out of the margin we think we've got and what we can manage, you don't need to be Christian to do that. True supernatural serving is when you serve out of the time, ability, energy, and resource that you don't have. That's when you step into a supernatural divine grace. Come on now. You don't need to be Christian to volunteer your time because I promise you, all over Australia today, all over the world today, all over Ireland, there are retired people, part-time employed, the unemployed, the ones that have Saturdays off. Christian or not are happily volunteering at school canteens, os kick, umpiring netball, coaching softball, cutting oranges for halftime at the, the under-13 soccer club. There's nothing spiritual or remarkable about volunteering your time when you have time to volunteer. What was Jesus teaching in Luke chapter 9? There's something deeply spiritual and divinely supernatural when you actually give the little of what you don't have, put it into the hands of God, and watch what God can do through your life. Someone shout amen. amen. 5,000 men plus women plus children, running out of daylight, no money. I mean, the miracle 
didn't happen in Jesus' hands. Your English translation Bible, the English translators would have put the heading, Jesus feeds the 5,000. It's not exactly accurate because Jesus didn't technically feed the 5,000. They just gave him the bread and fish. Jesus blessed it, broke it, put it back, read the scripture yourself, put it back into the hands of the disciples. The disciples were the ones that fed the 5,000 men plus women plus children. They were the ones that served beyond. They were the ones that initially said, please send them all home. We ain't got nothing left for them. I got nothing left, Jesus. At the end of the day, I want to clock off. Can we just go to a deserted place? And yet they find themselves now, a few chapters later, stepping into a divine grace, serving people beyond their own natural ability. See, you don't need to be Christian to volunteer out of what you do have but us as believers part of our discipleship is actually giving Jesus what little we think we might have of our supposedly busy lives to say to Jesus I ain't got much but what I do have I put into your hands would you do through me what is impossible in the natural so I can see the grace of God flowing out of me to be a blessing to others somebody shout amen as I began to think about volunteering I I I my mind cast back to when I was year 11 and year 12. I was actually on a student council in my high school. So I had a lot to do with Jenny, the canteen lady at my high school. Now, Jenny's not her real name. I'm protecting her original identity. <laughs> but um, I remember Jenny. She was the, probably the most well-loved person in the entire school community, Jenny the canteen lady. She volunteered every day at the school canteen. She was strong as an ox. She could carry those 40 kilo pallets of food like it was nothing. Jenny was, she was a self-confessed atheist. She smoked like a chimney. She swore like a sailor. She was on her third marriage at the time when she, but she, she was just so well loved by the entire school community. She was so committed to the, her canteen roster Every kid knew her. She knew every kid. She was just awesome. And I began to think about how you don't need to be Christian to volunteer because this lady was doing more as an atheist for the school than so many Christians are prepared to do for their own local church. You don't need to be Christian to volunteer of your time if you've got it to volunteer. All around Australia today, all around the world today in Ireland, I'm sure it's the same thing. All around, where you're watching online. You don't need to be Christian to give of your time to do something which you think is worthwhile and fulfilling for you. You would do it anyway. That's your basic civic duty. So what's different between the church and the world is the fact that people like you and I step into things that we cannot do. We do things that we don't have skills to do. We don't have resources to do. We don't have means to do it. We don't have margin to do it. But when we give the little of what we got, put it into the hands of Jesus, He breaks it all up, puts it back in our hands and says, go on, go and do it now. There's a grace of God flowing through you to do something supernatural called serving, which you ordinarily wouldn't be able to do if you did it in your own strength. That's where the miracle testimonies happen when you turn your ordinary hands into miracle hands. That's where the miracles actually happen. See, we would have never been reading four times over in all four Gospels of the feeding of the thousands of people out of a few loaves of fish and bread if Jesus actually gave the disciples what they asked for, which is to send everybody home. You'd been, you wouldn't be reading about the miracle. You wouldn't be reading about the miracle testimony. We don't send film crews over to your house to film you talk about how last night I came home, put my Udi on, sat on the couch, clocked off with my bag of Doritos and binge watched Netflix last night till midnight. No one, we don't send film crews over to your house to film that testimony. We don't. But what we do send film crews over to your house to film a testimony is like, I was going through a really crazy time in my life. Mum was in hospital. Gastro was sweeping through my house while my husband was away on site at work. And I had like two hours sleep and I nearly rang my team on Sunday to pull out of being a, on, on kids church. But I got here anyway and you wouldn't believe it. That Sunday there were two kids there from our children's school that came to church. I managed to connect with the parents. We started talking. At the end when we were packing down, I led them in prayer to receive Jesus in their hearts. They started crying. I started crying. But wait, there's more. This week they rang me and told me that they were so close to ending their marriage but they decided this week that they're going to give their marriage another go and they're going to counseling and they're going to work at restoring their marriage. All glory to God. That's the kind of stuff we want to hear. And that's a real story. Some years ago, somebody told me that. What defines the difference between Jenny the canteen lady and the body of Christ is the fact that we actually do things where we supposedly cannot do. Four of you are convinced. 
I know you don't want to hear this stuff. You just want to do things that you can manage. But I think it's a supernatural life. When we actually step into a space where we do things that we physically cannot do, don't have the talent to do, don't have the means to do. Luke chapter 9 is an incredible account. We see it everywhere. You would think that if Jesus wanted to feed the thousands, he would just snap his fingers and then there was food trucks everywhere. Take your pick. Paella on this side. Juicy bab bab dumplings on that side. Korean fried chicken over there. You know, kebabs over that side. You know, wood fried pizza on that side. Take your pick, right? That would have been awesome, but no. Nothing but loaves and fish. And Jesus decided, I'm going to make this a teaching moment. Can I ask you today, do you want to live a Christian life where your ordinary hands remain ordinary for the rest of your life? Or do you will, are you willing to take what little you've got and say, Jesus, what little I've got, I'm going to put in your hands. And when it's back in my hands, the grace of God's going to flow. My ordinary hands are going to turn into miracle hands. Come on, somebody. This was a moment of significant Christian maturation for the disciples. It was a maturing process for them. Because I believe that we need to grow from being Christians that ask God to do things for us to becoming disciples that let God do things through us. Somebody shout amen. That's the journey for us. Maturity ultimately is this, seeing the potential of what God can do through you in spite of what you're going through. For so many of us, this is how we calculate whether we can actually serve Jesus or not. We look at all the things we've currently got going on in our very, very important lives, all the things we're going through, all the circumstances, all the situations, and none of those things are untrue. I'm not denying the fact that life happens. We live in an incredibly busy world. Some of that is self-inflicted. Some of that is just life, right? But maturity is saying, in spite of all of the things that i got going on, I am going to serve you with what I've got, Jesus, and you're going to do supernaturally through me the rest of it. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 6, right? And, And if you can read about What Paul is trying to say here, in the way that he's serving Jesus, he says, we put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry or our serving will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, people who serve, we commend ourselves in every way. In other words, we qualify, we we put ourselves back in that place in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, and on and on it goes. In other words, Paul is saying this, I don't want to be a stumbling block to the people in the world where they look at my life and go, oh man, Paul quit after things got a little bit hard. I don't want to be a stumbling block to the people. So this is how I commend me and my apostolic team. This is how I commend our service That even in hardships, in spite of all the things that we're going through, we're going to stand our ground and do what we can with the little that we've got and allow Jesus. Come on, Corinthian church. You need to understand this today. This is what Paul was saying. Understand this today, Corinthian church. Part of maturing as Christians is to serve Jesus in spite of what is going on. Hardships, distresses, beatings, imprisonments, riots, hard work, sleepless nights, hunger. I don't think I've been through any of that in the last year. Right? I don't even know what it's like necessarily to even have a stomach that is growling with so much hunger because I haven't eaten all day. There's people in various parts of the world that go through that. Come on now. We feed people for heartbeat and people still don't even come. Right? We've got to change the framework around the way we see what we do for each other in the supernatural entity called the ecclesia and pull ourselves out of the ordinary, the temporal, the carnal, and see our ordinary hands as miracle hands. Come on, somebody, say amen. God has made available for us a grace to serve Him regardless of what we are going through. And yet so many of us aspire to live a life where we do as little as we can outside of what we can manage. I promise you, God gets no glory in that kind of life. God gets no glory in that kind of life. You know, and the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 wasn't just the fact that bread and fish multiplied. If you think about it, 12 men, 5,000 men plus women plus children. Where's Hannah Beatham? If you had that kind of ratio for your events, I would sack you. You're severely understaffed. You follow me so far? No hospitality company would staff 12 guys to feed 5,000 men plus women plus children on top of that. It's like, Jesus, if you were running a food and beverage company or a catering company, you'd get the sack or you'd run out of business. 
But how do you know Jesus doesn't work by conventional earthly ways of looking at things? It wasn't just the fact that fish and bread multiplied in the disciples' hands, but I think what was the learning lesson or the teaching lesson in all of this was the fact that Jesus divinely graced them with energy, speed. Come on. It was the end of the day. They were running out of daylight. How do 12 people feed completely thousands and thousands of people? How, how quickly do you have to pull bread and fish out of your hands to, to give to every family? 12 guys. Think about that. Think about the logistics of that. So God multiplied not just the bread and fish, but he multiplied their capability, their capacity, their energy, their, their, their margin, their, their, their strength. There was something divinely beautiful about that. It was an equally noteworthy and important miracle that God supernaturally, divinely multiplied their strength as much as the bread and fish. Multiplied their margin and their personal resource and, 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 and the, the grace on their life, their, their endurance to be able to do that. See, this is what I feel. You'll never go on a mission trip, minister to children, reach out to someone, commit to showing up every weekend and experience God giving you the grace to do it in spite of your sick mom, gastro running through your family, the small business having staffing issues, etc. If all that you do is consider your life in the light of what you can manage in the natural. We'll actually never end up stepping into our calling if all that we do is consider our lives in light of the capacity that we can manage right now. We will be consigned to only ever living a Christian life where we read about God doing things like the disciples feeding the 5,000, but never experiencing that kind of grace ourselves. Happy to leave miracles like that in the Bible, but never actually engaging with it and experiencing ourselves. So the deception of the devil to every modern Christian is this. He wants to keep you living an unremarkable life by telling you to live only according to what you can manage. And in that unremarkableness, you'll never experience the power, the beauty, the testimony of supernatural empowering. And then after time, you find yourself bored with your Christianity and say things like, I'm not getting anything out of my Christianity. And then suddenly he waves the appeal of a temporal fulfillment of everything that the world can give you. Even though it's not real, it's more appealing than the unremarkable life you've said yes to because you try to live the way that you can manage. I want to say this to you today. It's time to break that mentality and look at ordinary hands becoming miracle hands. Somebody shout amen. amen. The Bible says he created you for good works which he prepared beforehand, before you were even born, he already saw you doing things way beyond your natural ability because he divinely created you to flow through you. And you know that Jesus wants to emphasize something when he repeats things. How many of you had to, how many of you are trying to raise kids and you feel like you are like a broken record? Don't touch that. 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 And like your voice just gradually goes up like... Like mine and Chrissy, well, like mine sort of goes from like, don't touch it, don't touch it, to, don't touch it. Chrissy's just gradually goes up. You know, you can tell that she's winding up. It's a nicer incline. <laughs> she's just a better person than me. But Jesus had to repeat the lesson. The feeding of the 5,000 occurred across all four gospels, but that's a secondary miracle of feeding another crowd, of the feeding of the 4,000 in a different place. And that's found in the book of Matthew 15 and the book of Mark chapter 8. This time with seven loaves and just a few fish, they feed the crowd again. Again, it repeats the same conversation. Send them away, Jesus. We're tired at the end of the day. We're clocking off, right? Jesus saying, no, no, you feed them. And this is what I love about both the accounts of feeding the 5,000 plus the 4,000 is that at the end of all of that, the Bible says that the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls left over and seven basketfuls left over. The promise of God is when you think you haven't got anything left to give, when you, when you willingly give your ordinary hands and put it into the hands of Jesus and turn it into miraculous hands, there will always be more than enough for you. Come on, your family. All the things you think your family is missing out on because you're doing so much. God is going to pour out in you so much more. I thank God for the seasons when we were so worried, man, when we were in the early years of pioneering our church, man, we were hardly home and you were going, oh man, you know, God was doing more in our kids than we could do it staying at home with them. Come on now, somebody. 
And if we keep thinking about the natural way of serving the ecclesia, the supernatural spiritual entity of God, we'll never actually come to a place where we become the supernatural powerful bride of Christ. And we never must never serve God to gain something back. That, that's, that's, that, that kind of incentivized theology is not what I'm teaching. What I am saying is that if you're ever concerned about taking this step from being ordinary hands to miracle hands, you need to know that the promise of God is always abundant leftovers for you, abundant leftovers for your family, abundant leftovers for all that the people around you are going to experience because of your life. I don't ever want my children to see a mom and dad trying to live their Christian life, trying to manage their time. You don't need to be Christian to do that. I want my kids to see a mom and dad where they're scratching their heads going, Dad, I don't know how you do all that. Actually, Jensen said that to me recently. Dad, I don't know how you manage all that. And that began to talk, it began to open up the conversation about the grace of God, the divine enabling, the divine empowering. It opened up new conversations. You go, wow, yeah, that's amazing. That we were having a conversation that we ordinarily wouldn't have had had I just tried to manage my life. I don't know where you're at today, but I really feel that the Lord wants to take you from a place of having ordinary hands to miracle hands. Can we give God a big shout of praise? I'm going to land with this account. It's everywhere in Scripture where we see God drawing out supernatural divine things out of ordinary people. We see an account here of uh, a man by the name of Abraham in the Old Testament. How do you know Abraham? Abraham and his wife Sarah were unable to have children and they were past childbearing age in their old age where God gives him a promise that he's going to be the father of many nations. Now, if you've been unable to have kids for so many decades with your wife, that's either a very cruel promise or a very divinely supernatural one. Come on, you're following me so far. And so to cut a long story short, Abraham and Sarah finally conceive and they bear a son in the world called Isaac. But how many of you know that one son does not make many nations? The time comes when Isaac is going to have to find a wife, right? Now, how many of you here are raising young adults, single young adults as parents, and you're already praying for their spouse? You're praying for that they'll marry someone awesome. Come on. Yeah, God, you know, just, we're just praying that they'll have a great man or woman come alongside them, etc. right? Well, you try praying for a great spouse for your son or your daughter while you're living in the desert. Ain't much choice. I find it hilarious that so many single, like single guys, particularly in church, go, oh, there's not very many nice girls at, at church. There's not many nice girls. And the girls go, oh, there's that's not a lot of nice guys at church. Try living in the desert, honey. It's either the cactus or the camel. Choose. Isaac had no chance. So the servant was sent by Abraham with this mission impossible task of finding Isaac a wife. And so the servant thought, man, there's, there's, we're in the desert, Abraham, seriously. Cactus, 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 camels. Papa and his daughter, that's it. That's, it. that's in Australia. <laughs> then he thought, I, I, I'm going to go into town and this is, this is, this is how I think the right woman for Isaac is going to come about. She's going to offer, when I ask her to give me a drink of water, she's going to say yes, and then she's going to offer of her own accord to give my camels some water as well. How's that for qualifying yourself for being a wife? Watering camels. But we pick up the account of Genesis 24, verse 15. It says this, before he had finished even praying. I don't know that God knows what's on your heart before you even finish praying. Before he had finished praying, he saw a young woman named Rebecca coming out with a water jug on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, who was the son of Abraham's brother Nahor, and his wife Milcah. Rebecca was very beautiful. Here we go. All right. Looking promising. It is in the desert, though, so probably not much to compare it with. But Rebecca was very beautiful and old enough to be married, but she was still a virgin. She went down to the spring, filled her jug, and came up again, running over to her. The servant said, please give me a drink of water from your jug. So the servant, right, who's with Isaac, asked, sort of testing it out. Yes, my Lord, she answered. Have a drink. Okay, looking good so far. And she quickly lowered her jug from her shoulder and gave him a drink. When she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they've had enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jug into the watering trough and ran back to the well to draw water for all his camels. You can imagine the servant going, yes, Isaac, she's the one, she's the one. We found her. Awesome. The very thing that the servant was praying for Rebecca was doing, offering to do voluntarily, willingly. 
right? Now, you've got to understand, in biblical times in the Middle East, when a woman was asked by a man to be given a cup of water like the servant did, please, may you give me a little drink of water, she was obliged to society to say, yes, sir, and give him the water, which she does absolutely. That was her minimal requirement as a good citizen. Makes sense to you? Back in biblical days, very different to Australia. If you ask a woman these days to give you a drink of water, she'd probably say, what's wrong with your legs? <laughs> What'd your last slave die off? Back in those days, it was much more biblical. <laughs> and then she offers to do something completely out of the box. She says, well, sir, now that you've had your drink, I'll actually, your camels look thirsty. I'll water them too. Now, it sounds like a very nice thing to do, but if you think about what this volunteering of her heart and her actions actually meant, I don't know, you can look at Wikipedia, but an average Arabian camel that is thirsty can drink up to 130 liters of water in one sitting. A few, few verses before that, you see that the servant had 10 camels, 1,300 liters of water. The average capacity of a pitcher, a jug, back in those days, it was similar type to what they had, scholars believe, that would sit on a woman's shoulders, had the capacity of about three and a half to four liters of water. Think about what she just volunteered to do. <clears throat> four liters. That's how I walk with four kilos on my shoulder, pour into the trough, and then the camel's go. <laughs> Fantastic. She's running back. <laughs> four liters. Or camels go, oh, oh, oh. fantastic. 1,300 liters worth. Now, I'm a relatively fit guy, but I think even the fittest athletes couldn't keep up 50 reps of that. Come on now, somebody. So how does this young girl, we assume she's young or marriageable age, probably a young adult, maybe 20, 19, 20 years old, how would she manage to water 10 camels, 1,300 liters of water? Say, even if all they drank was a thousand liters of water, what was scripture trying to teach us? That because of her willingness, she didn't give out of what she could manage, but she gave out of the willingness of her own heart. And what it looks like on the surface as a young woman overestimating her camel watering ability was the very thing that God was looking for. People think that it was just a woman going over and above and watering camels. God was looking for a woman that would birth nations. So many of us say, God, use me, use me, Jesus, use me. Uh, would you like to serve people some coffee? God, I want to find my destiny. Well, would you show people to their seats so they can encounter Jesus? God, God, use me. I want to find my destiny. Well, would you sign up to go on a mission trip and play with kids that are in the slums? Come on now, somebody. Oh, let's see what I can manage. No, no, no. Can I stir in your heart today? You might have ordinary hands, but it's time to turn it into miracle hands because that's the kind of thing that will cause the world to sit up and notice. And if you're here today, I want to ask you today, may you consider all that you have in your life. Absolutely, factually, yep, you're busy. Yeah, you got stuff going on. But maybe just give of what you do have. Put it in the hands of Jesus and see what God can do through you in Jesus' name. Someone give Jesus a big shout of praise.